Schulz and the, and the organizers of this conference for having uh, invited me. It's always a great pleasure to be in the South for us who are condemned to be in the North. So that is one of the great attractions of Sao Paulo, quite apart from everything else and from this incredibly interesting conference. Now, uh, I'm beginning with a little uh, piece of film. Actually, you may note that my um, title has a little changed in order to fit to, uh, with the idea of uh, elective affinities, although I'm not quite sure whether the um, affinity that is signaled in the title is really an elective one. You will find out by yourself. Now, many of you might, must have seen the film, uh, My Architect, that uh, traces Nathaniel Kahn's discovery of the persona and the work of his father, Louis Kahn. One of the emotional moments of that uh, film is certainly the encounter with Edmund Bacon, the one-time famous urban uh, planner of Philadelphia, an encounter which ends rather uh, clamorously in an outburst with regards to Kahn's competence as an urbanist, an outburst that, if you remember, and as you will see in a moment, uh, seems to surprise Nathaniel to a certain degree. Uh, now, uh, note that the conversation that I'm going to play uh, shows at the foot of play takes place at the foot of Philadelphia City City Hall. You see the City Hall Tower in the background, which crops up in practically all drawings that Louis Kahn has ever made of Philadelphia connection with his multiple proposals for that city of which you will see some. Uh, you will see in the background also a very strange cruciform administration tower, which happens to be the municipal administration building which replaces the project that uh, Khan together with Anne Ting had uh, made up for the city hall tower, which you also see at some point, uh, point in the lecture. So why don't I just uh, go ahead and uh, show you that little piece that many... Ed uh, Bacon uh, was Lou's nemesis in Philadelphia. Uh, Bacon was in charge of rebuilding the entire downtown area in the 50s and 60s, and he hired Lou to come up with plans for how the job should be done. But something had gone very wrong. We started work, and I wanted to communicate to the stupid public in the most acerbic fashion I possibly could, the essence of the idea. And Lou would say, wouldn't it be nice to put a curving stairway here? Or how about a uh, kind of a little tower here? And suddenly I realized that the purity of my uh, communication was being encrusted by Lou's fantasy. So Lou didn't get it. Lou didn't understand what he wanted. He didn't wanted. understand. He did not understand. And so, he was angry, as could be angry, and he got nice ladies to give teas where they would complain about me not using Lucon for this purpose. By the way, there's not a single shred of any way in which Lou influenced downtown Philadelphia. Well, I know. Isn't that a tragedy? Well, I tell you one thing. It's thing. It would have been an incredible tragedy if they had built one single thing that Lou proposed to them. They were all brutal, totally insensitive, totally impractical. The uh, whole idea of doing circular garages up on Pine Street. Yeah, the, the, the idea of leaving the cars outside the city and then letting people walk into the city. It was a great idea, don't you think? No! <laughs> it absolutely wasn't. It wouldn't have worked for a damn. So ultimately, isn't it just two strong men, two strong egos that don't get God it? damn it, no! <laughs> it's an absolutely pure ignorance on Lou's part. And it's the same damn ignorance as the American Institute of Architects is based on now. That you have no responsibility to preparing the way for a system on the whole larger order. And you only do the little things that come along. So you simply have not understood the word I'm saying. <laughs> so, who is, can I have a little, a little bit of light? Now the question is really, who is Edmund Bacon? Um, as I just said, uh, this uh, 
picture was taken in the 1960s and shows him as, in his role as a gardener of the city of Philadelphia, arranging the area of Society Hill, east of the inner city of Philadelphia, which is actually his most famous project, arguably, in the 1960s, the project that made him famous. And I think it's a rather fitting portrait of sorts for the long-time director of the Philadelphia Planning Commission from 1949 to 1970, and for the man behind Philadelphia's emergence in the 1950s and 60s as the American model for a reasonable form of urban renewal, reasonable or even soft, as opposed to the kind of more ruthless planning strategies for which New York became famous under the planning commissioner Robert Moses, who, as you know, also played a certain role in uh, Sao Paulo. Bacon had studied in Cranbrook under Eliel Saarinen, who came to Philadelphia in the early 1940s as a managing director of a local housing association. And in this function, he had come to work closely together with an architect, uh, with a very solid Philadelphia background, Oskar Stonerov. Stonerov, in turn, who had studied in Zurich and who had worked with the Corbusier, actually published one of the volumes of the Oeuvre Complete by the Corbusier. Stonerov had introduced Bacon to his then partner, the slightly older Louis Kahn. And at that moment, Stonerov and Kahn had already been involved in neighborhood activism and planning for several years. <laughs> so that Bacon quite naturally turned to the two architects as his allies, even more so, of course, when he became director of Philadelphia City Planning Commission in 1949, an important moment for architecture and planning in the United States, because it is the moment when the Federal Housing Act made uh, the uh, nowadays ridiculous, but at that time extremely important sum of $500 million available for urban renewal. Um, Kahn had become relatively well known nationally at that point with some housing projects done under the New Deal. In 1939, for instance, he uh, exhibited a rather, this is actually Carver Court, a uh, housing project done 41, 43. This is uh, an interior view of one of these workers' houses. In 1939, uh, he exhibited a rather extravagant master plan for the future development of Philadelphia, um, shown at the Museum of Modern Art, a project that, apart from obviously reflecting the Corbusier's Plan Voisin, can also be seen as a response to Norman Belgedis's or Henry Dreyfus's Democracy, exhibited at the New York World's Fair of that year. Here you have uh, that very famous uh, uh, installation in the big bowl uh, uh, at the entrance of um, the New York World's Fair, indicating, I mean, a work, a project, <coughs> variation of the theme of the Grand Voisin, indicating that, as obviously was also the case with the Corbusier, Kahn had an obvious talent for and invested considerable energy in issues of graphic promotion of the ideas he stood for. He was a graphic designer, an interpreter, an artist uh, who produced works illustrated of uh, urbanistic uh, and societal uh, ideas. Typical in this context, um, a advertisement Stonerov and Kahn had done for a private developer around 1940, an ad that promotes, as you can see, selective bulldozing in rundown, rundown neighborhoods as a means to preserve the healthy parts of those uh, areas, and thus as a, condition, as a condition of their survival, whereas in other cities, such as New York or Boston, entire neighborhoods were singled out for extinction and then replaced by new building, the most famous example obviously being Sturgeon Village in New York. Now, if uh, Moses bulldozing of entire parts of the city made urban renewal synonymous with urban removal, then Bacon's approach, and that, which was at that point very much also Stonerov's and Kahn's approach, and as a matter of fact, it was really from Stonerov and Kahn 
that to a significant degree Bacon had taken over this idea. And as far as that is concerned, his assertion that there was not a shred of uh, a new Philadelphia that owed anything to Louis Kahn is not entirely correct because I mean, Kahn and Stonehoff have preceded uh, Bacon uh, with promoting this soft approach to urban renewal. So it was on the basis of this soft renewal that Philadelphia, that the so-called Philadelphia cure to the urban decline, that is clearing slums with penicillin, not surgery, as the architectural forum explained in 1952, became uh, famous. So this is Stuyvesant Village. This is uh, that uh, bulldozing proposal. The very method of thinking of the city as a garden that needs to be kept healthy by ways of substituting worn out substance by new transplants and grafts, as is uh, very clearly shown in this image, will later serve as the design idea for an exhibition in which uh, Bacon was very importantly uh, involved, and he was the initiator of that exhibition together with Stonerov, an exhibition that used, in fact, movable models to uh, constantly compare the bad present of Philadelphia with <coughs> possibilities of better futures. So this is the anticipation of that principle, and this is the way it was then enacted in this exhibition, the so-called uh, Better Philadelphia exhibition that was shown in Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia in 1947. The aim being to generate interest among the citizens of Philadelphia for the new ways uh, by which life in the city can be improved through the help of urban renewal. And as far as that is concerned, this exhibition had a far-reaching impact, I think, on urban thinking, actually, not only in America, but also in, in Europe. Actually, I remember an interview that Albert Speer, Jr., the son of uh, uh, Hitler's architect was an important, uh, still a very active uh, urbanist, gave uh, in the 1960s to the magazine Der Spiegel, where he explained that uh, uh, this uh, exhibition and actually Edmund Bacon's work on Philadelphia had been absolutely crucial for him as an inspiration for his own work as an urbanist in Germany in the 1970s and 80s, which is quite interesting I think, from a global uh, perspective, if you will. Now, in my, uh, this is the view of this uh, exhibition, which was really, uh, must have been quite an extraordinary event. Here we see uh, the plan of the, of the show with a ramp descending from the upper story onto a display room where you had a diorama-like presentation of uh, the history of Philadelphia and then an extremely complex uh, scenario of uh, exhibits of the sort that I have already uh, uh, indicated. Now, in my first draft for this lecture, I plan to speak rather extensively on the triangle study that culminated in the uh, Penn Center Plaza, which you have briefly seen actually in that short movie that I showed uh, before, in the background of uh, Nathaniel Kahn and, uh, uh, and, and Bacon in this uh, memorable encounter. The triangle being the part of the inner city bordered by Mark Street to the south. Now, I do not have my, oh, I may have actually a little pointer. Um, oh, you have one. The triangle, Philadelphia's triangle, is that part here, which is uh, defined by Benjamin Franklin Parkway, the diagonal uh, Beaux-Arts uh, Avenue, the Champs-Élysées, which points from the city to Fairmont Park, and uh, Market Street, Market Street West, Market Street East here, and is occupied at its southern border by the remains of uh, Broad Street, uh, Broad Street Station. Now, um, Broad Street Station was a very important building by uh, Frank Furness, still extant in the 1950s, but due for uh, now um, unavoidable, uh, unavoidable uh, 
demolition, which opened the way, obviously, for uh, something that had been described by a Philadelphia journalist as probably the largest single space to become available at the center of an American city in the 20th century. Uh, this is the station as it was still standing in the uh, uh, late 1940s. This is a drawing by Kahn from the roof of City Hall, which is a building that you've already seen, looking up towards the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art in the right corner, and of course on top of the rails of uh, the Broad, station, uh, Broad Street Station. Now, um, the triangle was, in fact, this area here, the triangle was where Bacon's and Kahn's collaboration began, a collaboration within which Kahn turned out to be incredibly productive, an incredibly productive visualizer of urbanistic ideas, ideas which might partly have been Bacon's or those of other architects, yet a collaboration which also revealed a number of themes a number of design attitudes that are distinctly Kahnian, such as A, the surprisingly conservative approach with regards to the existing urban context, I mean by the standards, for instance, of somebody like Robert Moses, in particular uh, with regards to the Bozar buildings around uh, Logan Circle and the rather beautiful railway administration building and Art Deco office building of the 1930s that, as you will see in a moment, uh, survives in practically all the studies that um, uh, Kahn is going to make uh, for this area. These are, this is the, the still, of course, functioning public library, a very beautiful sort of reproduction of sorts of the Place de la Concorde in, in, in Paris. This uh, area becoming, in Kahn's proposals, the civic center of the new Philadelphia. And B, um, apart from his uh, interest in the existing uh, urban context, a marked fascination, and this may be an aspect that interests more specifically, perhaps also from a Brazilian point of view, a marked fascination with the slab-shaped office building, more specifically a fascination with the monumental possibilities of that type of the slab-shaped office building, a fascination that raises obviously questions uh, uh, indeed of selective affinities, raises questions that regard Brazil, that regard Niemeyer. Um, could Kahn have known the Ministry of Education in Rio? Of course, he has known, he must have known, every architect in this country has known the publications of this building uh, that were, of course, that was so, such an important highlight in the Brazil show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1943. Affinities that reverberate with biographical coincidences. Note that Kahn began teaching at Yale at the time when planning uh, of Penn Center began, and that he was invited to Yale as a replacement for Oskar Niemeyer, who, as a communist, had not been uh, granted an entry visa to the United States. So I think uh, Kahn's career as a teacher is intimately linked to the phenomenon of Oskar Niemeyer. And that reverberate also with local Philadelphia political ambitions and circumstances. Note that Kahn, after World War II, had been part of a very vocal group of people who were convinced that the United Nations headquarters absolutely needed to be brought to Philadelphia. Both circumstances, the Niemeyer rivalry and the United Nations ambition that throw some light, I think, on the charge of representation, or if you will, the charge of symbolism that Kahn invested into his proposals for the Penn Center proposals, which I want to show just very briefly. I don't want to discuss them in detail because we don't have the time for this, but I want to show them very briefly because they introduce you into the climate of Kahn's um, way of uh, participating in the development of this uh, type that was going to be such an important motive in the, you know, the Western uh, urbanistic uh, imagery uh, in the Cold War era. This, incidentally, is a postcard that shows the completed result of that uh, long planning operation in which uh, Bacon, Kahn, and quite a number of additional uh, Philadelphia architects were involved. 
with the two buildings actually uh, that you have already seen, um, because that is where this conversation with Nathaniel uh, Kahn and uh, um, Bacon had taken place. This is this railway administration building, a very beautiful, very elegant uh, Art Deco building, which plays such an important role, which is still extant, and which, as you can see, um, is highlighted in many of the studies that Khan was doing on uh, uh, that subject of the planned uh, Penn Center, with this sunken uh, commercial uh, shopping concourse that was given quite an important civic uh, character in those drawings by Khan. This is a proposal he made in 1950 that sums up his idea of concentrating commercial and administrative functions here in the immediate neighborhood of City Hall while uh, concentrating civic functions uh, around this existing uh, Bozar situation of Logan Circle. This is May 1950, a very beautiful drawing by Kahn. This is July 1950, a variation on that theme done by Kahn in collaboration with other Philadelphia architects, where, now, as you can see, the series of slabs has been multiplied to the number of 11 slabs. These are two quite interesting slides, I think never published, um, uh, from Kahn's collection, where he, in many, many lectures, obviously, presented his uh, ideas towards the center of Philadelphia. This is the formal plan of 1950 that was developed uh, in collaboration with Kahn, Bacon and others for uh, the uh, Penn Center with, as you can see, the sunken concourse with, as you can see, a slight modification of the existing uh, city hall of which only the tower survives, actually even in the 1920s, Paul Cray, uh, um, Kahn's master, had already proposed to demolish city hall and just to preserve the city hall tower, which is an idea which is now being picked up even by Bacon and Kahn in this particular proposal. Now, uh, uh, obviously, the reference to the then most important, most visible, you know, slab building in the Western world, which is about at this moment to be built. Uh, the decision, the design decision had been taken in 1947, so this is, of course, the immediate context. context and this is a context of which, of course, Kahn had been exceedingly conscious as another project of his, the Jefferson Memorial Project, of which an alternative to this, of course, by Sarin and the Arch, has been realized. This is Kahn's competition entry, which is indeed 1947. This is the year of the Better Philadelphia exhibition, a direct variation on the theme. Actually, you could even argue a radicalization of the theme of the United Nations project by Niemeyer and uh, Corbusier, then uh, executed by Wallace Harrison. Um, just to give you the context, this is the icon as we know it, and this is the uh, Philadelphia um, you know, appropriation of that icon uh, that was uh, charged with, uh, with quite a number of civic and monumental uh, implications that uh, have to do, uh, as I just uh, suggested, with this uh, long-time ambition that had become very alarmingly present in the controversies uh, in around 1947-48, towards uh, uh, connected with his ambition of Philadelphia to become the seat of the United Nations. Now, um, Bacon realized that this would not work. I mean, the, 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 there wasn't the developer and the investor who would finance this thing. So he connected with a local architect, Vincent Kling, who had the genius idea to turn those slabs around by 90 degrees, therefore, uh, thereby, adding something like 30% of rentable floor space to uh, the situation which is the moment when Kahn uh, sort of left uh, the group, or as, as a matter of fact, that is the moment when um, Bacon decided that uh, he needed to get rid of the idealist and formalist Kahn and uh, lead it to work with Vincent Kling, who had proposed this uh, turning around of uh, the towers 
and uh, a turning around that then uh, was you know, multiplied and actually accentuated by a number of additional buildings around the area that um, uh, guaranteed the necessary uh, profits for the investors to go ahead with uh, the, with the uh, planning. Now, uh, part of the project, a part of the project that was very important for Khan and Bacon originally was of course the sunken concourse, uh, which uh, needed to be totally sacrificed, or actually which survived in the end. This is the model of the sunken concourse, and what survived is a rather truncated version that we have now, the concourse which is only very partly open, which is incorporated in this uh, commercial development uh, uh, immediately adjacent to uh, the city hall. Now, Khan uh, was out by this moment because he was no longer acceptable, uh, no longer realistic enough in order to be uh, an acceptable uh, discussion partner in this new business situation in the center of Philadelphia. Bacon uh, seemed to be relatively content with the compromise that was found, and he actually even engaged a photographer who made a series of snapshots of him in the recently uh, built uh, Penn Center, as you can see here, snapshots which perhaps uh, wisely he never published. I found them in the, uh, in the archive, and this is the uh, general situation um, uh, uh, of uh, Penn Center as you, uh, as you would find it around 1960. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, this being uh, the, the altered situation uh, with respect to Plan's proposals, what you would find now, of course, is a totally different situation within which this uh, arrangement here survives as a, as a miniature uh, city uh, in the style of the 1950s and 60s, surrounded by a towering, by a towering inferno, if you will, of uh, 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 skyscrapers that now make up the center of Philadelphia. Now, what happened is that Khan, having become an academic teacher, as I just uh, uh, said, began to develop his own approach to city building, having been marginalized uh, from, uh, from uh, the Philadelphia scene, um, develop his own approach to city building or to the graphic visualization of urban dynamics, which turned out to be increasingly detached from the day-to-day -day functionalities of urban design as it was practiced by Bacon, and that culminated around 1956-7 in his various proposals for the nearby Market East area, I mean the uh, area east of City Hall, which would be uh, the area here below. This is, just to give you an idea of the reality, this is Kahn's visionary anticipation of the civic center of Philadelphia. This is the reality as we find it now, as we look through exactly the same street. Um, now, uh, uh, Kennedy Boulevard uh, from the city hall, or from the city center, from the city hall would be standing behind us towards the 30th Street uh, station. <coughs> now, Khan, as you know, would then go on with proposals that somewhat understandably infuriated Bacon for their impracticality, while they fascinated a growing international audience for their didactic clarity, <coughs> for their intriguing monumental and antiquarian pathos, for their bold redefinition of the Siam type new monumentality in a way that seemed to offer an alternative to what had by then become the Cold War stereotype of urbanism in terms of the office slab. In short, that seemed to offer an alternative way of thinking that also allowed Philadelphia, after all, the cradle of the American Union, Benjamin Franklin, Liberty Hall, and all that, uh, that allowed Philadelphia to resonate with memories of imperial Rome. So we have a rather triumphal <coughs> kind of view of the city of the future. Finally, the city as a fair, the city's increasing affinity with the fair, of which we don't quite know if it is an elective affinity or rather an undesired proximity, if not an increasingly dangerous, yet perhaps irreversible promiscuity, some uh, perhaps uh, possible themes for future ARM conferences. 
um, irreversible promiscuity as opposed to collective affinity in, in, in architecture. And here, of course, it would be appropriate, um, not to say indispensable, to insert an entire chapter on Bozar planning, or rather on the coalition of urbanism on the one hand and fairs on the other, as a key to 20th century uh, urbanism. The chapter that obviously begins with the Chicago Fair of 1893, and that definitely, and I think this is important in our context, that definitely has one of its great moments in Philadelphia. The city that had held the preceding World's Fair, the World's Fair, first World's Fair on, an Ameri on American soil that preceded Columbia Fair of uh, 1893, namely 1876, the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, and that looked at more closely, turns out to have arguably been more thoroughly shaped by this coalition of urbanism and fairs, Philadelphia arguably having been shared more thoroughly by this coalition of urbanism and fairs, more thoroughly than any other city worldwide, I would argue, with the possible exception of Paris, of course, that with its Eiffel Tower, its Grand Palais, Petit Palais, Palais de Chaillot, etc., is obviously one of the major metropolises that has been, whose modern face is determined by the presence of quite a number of world fairs <coughs> on the site of the city itself. But that's the same to a certain degree with uh, Philadelphia. This is, you know, Chicago in the visionary anticipation of Burnham that never materialized, as opposed to Philadelphia, where the Beaux-Arts city dream materialized, as a matter of fact, in terms of this Champs-Élysées, which was planned ever since the early 20th century as an axis that would connect the monumental center of Philadelphia with the area of Fairmount Park, which is where the World's Fair uh, in 1876 was held which is where the Fine Arts Museum was being built in the early decades of the 20th century. Note that all this was uh, an enormous project building site at the time uh, Louis Kahn was a student at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. <coughs> it was actually at that moment when the largest urbanistic intervention ever envisioned in Philadelphia since its founding was undertaken, was in any case still on the way, namely the opening of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, which created that uh, breakthrough from the city towards Fairmount Park, uh, where, as I just said, the World's Fair had uh, been uh, held. Now, uh, this is just a couple of images that remind you of the situation that Tom had encountered as a student. These are obviously uh, uh, illustrations from Hegemann's book on Amerikanische Architektur und Stadtbaukunst. This is an early photograph, also done in the 1920s. This is uh, a, a caricature that visualizes, you know, Penn standing on top of the uh, city hall tower overlooking uh, the scene, looking down on the Fine Arts Museum in the background. And this is the postcard, which you've already seen, that also shows you Penn, William Penn, the the, the mythical city founder in his uh, still dominating role in the city fabric of uh, Philadelphia. Note that upon finishing his degree, Kahn was hired as chief designer of the Sesquicentennial International Exhibition, a fair located somewhere to the south of the city uh, that commemorated the 105th, the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 1926, a fair that turned out to be a tremendous flop, as one of Kahn's friends later stated, but that provided Kahn with an experience and possibly also with a sense of scale and a sense of geometry that appears to have stayed with him uh, for decades. Now, uh, this is this uh, curious, uh, you know, forgotten exhibition of 1926 uh, with uh, one building that I think uh, commands a certain interest uh, that was designed by Kahn, who was an assistant to the city architect Monitor, John Monitor in Philadelphia, but it was Kahn who did the design of these buildings, in particular also the design of the Palace of Fashion 
This is the plan, the palace of fashion, and I don't need to go into details to uh, you know, argue that this, at least in terms of scale and in terms of form and in terms of degree of abstraction, has a lot to do uh, in a certain ways with uh, uh, passions that became uh, very important for architecture in, uh, uh, by ways of uh, uh, you know, characterizing Kahn's own work as an architect in the, 19, in, in the 1970s. Now, against this background of fairs that played such an important role both for Philadelphia and in the career of Louis Kahn, it is perhaps less absurd to take at face value the, after all, quite obvious associations that come to mind when one tries to make sense of the elements that punctuate the physiognomy of that city. Elements like this uh, City Hall Tower project, which I've already alluded to, elements like these colossal garages, which uh, Bacon refers to in this interview, which Kahn actually uh, represents uh, here in plan, juxtaposing next to it the plan of the Colosseum in Rome, uh, just in brackets, I'm still not quite sure whether, whether it was actually Kahn who made explicit this juxtaposition with the Colosseum, or whether it was Heinz Ronner who did this uh, incredible you know, documentation of drawings by Kahn in the 1960s in connection with the Zurich exhibition of 1968. In any case, uh, the reference is clear, and I do think we are allowed to make a certain number of additional references in this connection, uh, such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you will, Corbusier, Verne Architecture, and obviously, you know, uh, the Atomium, 1958, and of course, uh, the Colosseum itself, after all, the Western archetype of an architecture of spectacle, even if the Corbusier, maybe perhaps also Louis Kahn, saw it primarily as a geometry. Now, even though, of course, we know that the issues at stake in proposals such as these are profoundly urbanistic issues, not just issues of spectacle, I don't want to overdo the point, as is certainly true first for <coughs> Kahn's famous traffic plan for Philadelphia, which is the raison d'etre, after all, behind the idea of the cylindrical parking lots. Uh, the traffic study published in Prospecta of 1953, this is uh, one of the famous, uh, uh, the famous graphics that go along with it that also highlight Kahn's ambitions as a, as a visualizer of uh, urban uh, uh, dynamics. Um, I don't want to go into details reminding you of the fact that uh, along with these drawings came uh, quite a sophisticated analysis of the city and of transportation in the city, of circulation in the city in terms of it being differentiated into categories like rivers, harbors, canals, docks, all that then uh, you know, culminating in this uh, vision of these garage towers combined with department stores and, and a hotel that would be wrapped around the uh, parking structure, also quite curious that this parking structure here is represented in a way that almost suggested a ruined state, uh, which makes it in a sort of a certain degree which associates it even more directly to uh, this uh, icon of the Colosseum that I've already, uh, already evoked. Now, the traffic study, the famous traffic study, whose color coding is taken over directly from the Corbusier, uh, whose oeuvre complet, which has uh, the corresponding uh, you know, very comparable plans of saint Dié, just having been barely published. Whereas the degree of abstraction to which the city is subjected in these studies, uh, I think, can uh, evoke memories that go much farther into the past uh, that may have uh, even something to do with uh, the conceptual uh, fortification studies of the Renaissance. Here I'm just uh, uh, reminding you of Le Corbusier's traffic studies, if you will, uh, saint dié uh, and Bogota. And this is uh, Kahn's, I um, apologize for the very bad slide, one of the visualization of the traffic dynamics of the city that comes, uh, you know, uh, strangely close 
to some things that we know from history that strangely not, do not want to show up now on the screen, which may be even better because uh, that uh, connection with Michelangelo's fortification growing may in fact be a little bit uh, too hazardous, so it doesn't, um, technology um, doesn't want to help me in this connection, but the point that I really want to make is that these uh, speculation, this way of arguing about the city, obviously is the argument about the city by a teacher who is standing in front of his blackboard, who explains dynamics, who explains uh, theories by ways of doodles uh, placed on the blackboard, something that obviously we know from Le Corbusier uh, that had a strong impact on his uh, urban thinking and that gave it a, didem a dimension and a character and also a function in his didactics, which is obviously quite different from the pragmatic ambitions that uh, were uh, in the foreground uh, in the work of somebody like, um, um, like Edmund Bacon. And it's perhaps also true, though less clearly so, that it's also true for Kant's extraordinarily interesting studies towards the city hall tower. In fact, the building housing the municipal administration that Philadelphia so badly needed. And you have seen that actually such a building had been built in the background of the uh, existing city hall. A project due, as we know, largely to Anne Ting, who prior to her year-long collaboration and then also liaison with Kahn had studied and worked with Buckminster Fuller. Now this is a spread <coughs> from her thesis that she'd done with Buckminster Fuller. In fact, Ting and Kahn are rather explicit about the biophysical symbolism of the geometric structure, quite apart from its origins in Viola Le Duc. Uh, I mean, uh, as has been argued by many uh, scholars, including particularly Kenneth Frampton, that Viola Le Duc has been extremely important in connection with uh, Kahn's development of the structure of this building. At one point, uh, and Ting even derives the form of the tower from the three-dimensional visualization of the DNA formula that just barely discovered, had just been barely discovered by James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953. This is one of the visualizations of the DNA formula. And this is, uh, again, I don't get this image. Here it is. Yes, it is. Um, the, uh, scientific publication in the magazine Nature of that formula. And I do think it is a quite an extraordinary you know, aspect of this project that it translates a highly uh, abstract <laughs> formula from the natural sciences, from biophysics into architectural form, obviously in anticipation of metabolism uh, uh, in, the, in the most direct sense, which is why actually the calm was so important in connection with the origins of the metabolist movement in Japan in the late 1950s and, uh, and, and the 1960s, um, uh, which, is, which gives, of course, this project of uh, the city hall tower, which you see here in a model done in Kahn's office in the 1950s. Uh, uh, and here I'm showing the model that we've done in connection with the Kahn exhibition that is currently being shown at the Vitra Museum in Wild on Rhine, where we um, reconstructed that model in a 4.5 meter high construct or sculpture, if you will, uh, to emphasize the importance of this uh, particular uh, project. Now, one thing is sure, that there is no, it, now the question is, um, of course, in all this connection, I do think that the direct analogy with the DNA formula um, doesn't render the uh, association with the atomium particularly ludicrous in any case. Does this mean that Kahn intended to bring the World's Fair to the center of Philadelphia? I mean, this is what might be understood as being the bottom line of my message here. Now, I want to make clear that one thing is absolutely uh, to be taken for granted, there is no explicit written evidence of Kahn ever having made such a proposal. I mean, he was not proposing that the World's Fair should be brought to Philadelphia. But then, what do we do with the evidence of these drawings that I've just shown? And what do we do with the this time extensively documented written evidence, as has made clear by 
the biographer Heller, the biographer of uh, Edmund Bacon in an, in an essay recently published, the evidence that some of Kant's contemporaries have indeed proposed to redefine Philadelphia as a fairground, and in fact, repeatedly and even stubbornly so, most of all, Edmund Bacon. In fact, this is another view of the tower. In fact, the Brussels World's Fair had barely closed its doors when Bacon launched the idea of making Philadelphia the site of a, yet another World's Fair in 1959. World's Fair Brussels had just closed in 1958. And he wasn't even first to do so. No later than 47, Stonerov, perhaps blinded by the success of his Better Philadelphia exhibition, proposed a World's Fair in the midst of Philadelphia to be held in 1953 and to be given the form of a glass structure that would cover the entire area of the former Pennsylvania Railroad tracks along Market Street, placed 20 feet above street level and served by a monorail. Very strange. And Bacon then moved the proposal, the moved the proposed date to 1976, as to make it coincide with the bicentennial of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And again, in order for such a fair to be beneficial for Philadelphia's rebirth, so he thought and repeatedly argued, it needed to be scheduled within the city. The city itself needed to become the fair. Now, as unlikely as all this may seem at first sight, by the end of the 1950s, Philadelphia was, in fact, well on its way to becoming a permanent exhibition of sorts, and certainly a tourist attraction. First of all, by ways of gigantic, and I think the word is not exaggerated, of gigantic sventamenti that served to transform parts of the inner city into a park, in fact, into Independence National Historic Park. If you approach Philadelphia on the freeway, you will have something like five you know, exits towards the city center, the most important one being marked as Independence National Historic Park. So the city of Philadelphia, the center of the city of Philadelphia, is Independent National Historic Park, is a fairground. And to redevelop Society Hill, that was the second aim of these sentimenti, to redevelop Society Hill as an elegant neighborhood for the ex-suburban gentry. Now, this is the area of Society Hill that you see here marked with the red Dot, well, that is actually, uh, the red dot is Independence Hall, and the green dot is Society Hill. Now, of course, those sventramenti were not quite of the magnitude of those operated by Mussolini in Rome, but after all, um, totally analogous in tendency and in character. So, this is Philadelphia around 1950, this is the Savings Bank, a very distinguished building by <coughs> Frank Furness, who was also the architect of the no longer extant uh, Road Street Station. And Independence Hall is actually here. This is the top of the tower of Independence Hall. This is the exact same site as it looked a few years later, <coughs> when the Sventramento was in process that led to the purification and the isolation of Strickland's famous you know, uh, uh, neoclassical Schinkel period um, federal bank building with uh, Carpenter's Hall here, one of the important historic landmarks of the United States, that you know, begins to transform the inner city into a garden, into an open park. And I don't want to go into any details, just to remind you of what uh, Philadelphia has this fairground uh, where you know classes from all states of the United States would come and celebrate uh, the greatness of the history of the United States. This is actually Independence Hall um, with the commercial uh, housing houses and installations immediately across the street in the early 1950s. This is the late 1950s, apologize, yes, here it is, uh, the situation after the cleaning up, as wanted by Bacon and as wanted by the National um, 
you know, um, park service. This is, if it comes, no, it doesn't want to come, or here it does, a drawing that Venturi made in the 1980s uh, that highlights the proportion of St. Peter's uh, and the paradox of St. Peter's as an, an enormous building having a relatively modest forecourt of the Piazza San Pietro, which of course the uh, Via della Conciliazione, which uh, then continues this way as we've seen two days ago, as opposed to the minuscule, you know, Independence Hall that dominates a space that is three times longer than the Piazza San Marco, a sort of an urbanistic paradox which highlights uh, the, um, you know, um, irrationalism of, uh, in, in Venturi's view, of Bacon's uh, concept. Now, Bacon's concept, of course, had this other dimension of uh, gentrifying uh, the eastern part of the inner city with Society Hill. This is from Bacon's book, Design of Cities, which, of course, is a book that was published in order to highlight the glory of Philadelphia as a model of uh, you know, sound contemporary urban design. This is now the green city that has uh, you know, been made out of the black or dark gray reality of Philadelphia. And what I do think is extremely interesting is that Bacon even highlights this project here, which happens actually to be a project by <coughs> Louis Kahn, namely the Mikve Synagogue, uh, which is uh, here highlighted, actually this is in the second edition of uh, Bacon's book, where he highlights, goes as far as highlighting uh, this project by Kahn for, um, for Philadelphia. And this is, of course, Society Hill in a newspaper article. And this is Society Hill in a photograph you've already seen with this other famous strict land uh, building, the customs building uh, that has been freed, uh, you know, made available as an exhibit, if you want, in the urban fabric, and of course with the Iron Pace, famous Society Hill Tower, one of the two as a model in the foreground. And this is a photograph of which I'm particularly proud because I took it myself as a student in 1968 in my first visit to Philadelphia, the part of the gentrified Philadelphia as purified and you know pushed up uh, by um, Bacon. Now what is interesting is that Kahn's uh, endeavors and Kahn's proposals for the city, and in particular of course the Mikwe Synagogue, which is arguably one of his most beautiful uh, proposals uh, altogether, one of his most carefully worked out projects altogether, the Mikwe Synagogue is absolutely part of this beautification of Philadelphia as a exhibition space, as a national historic park. This is the Phil this Independence Mall, and in fact part of the glory and the ambition of the Mikwe Synagogue would have been, uh, if it would have been built, to have been situated uh, on this national uh, uh, monument, uh, on the mall, uh, which would have given, you know, also the Jewish community, of course, a presence, a, a monumental presence in the fabric of uh, uh, Philadelphia, which perhaps was not um, to the liking of the majority um, of those who had a say in matters of urban design and architecture in uh, Philadelphia. Now, back to Kahn. When Robert Venturi, who was then working in Kahn's office, drew a perspective of downtown Philadelphia, this is actually a drawing uh, done by Robert Venturi, it was obviously not housing that the plan was all about. This is no longer the era, the era of the welfare state, but a sports stadium situated at the center of the plan, as if by coincidence the location will later be occupied by a congress center. So this is nowadays the congress center here envisioned as a sports stadium. This of course is City Hall as you uh, will know. This is the PSFS tower by Howe and Liskars. And here of course you have Independence Hall somewhere. I don't find it. Where is it? I think this is Independence Hall and Venturi already at this point was reluctant to draw uh, the, the mall as envisioned and uh, at that time already uh, enacted by um, Bacon. Kahn took another piece of tracing paper and drew his cylindrical parking structures on top 
of a tourist perspective. This is what uh, this is one of the drawings that we know, one of the versions of that view that we know of, um, with of course the famous parking structures. Now, true, the formal reference, the formal references of that project are uh, historical, archaeological, archetypal. The parking structures take their dimensions from the Colosseum in Rome, as you've seen, while when rendered in bird's eye view, also recalling medieval fortress towers, or more specifically, perhaps, Norman castles, and the way their domestic functions, house, stables, where places are assembled within the closed interiors, all associations about which uh, calm was relatively explicit. I don't want to go into any details. These are the variations done on the basis of that perspective drawing that Venturi had been um, uh, working out in the office of Khan. And these are some of the references, which of course you all know about. I mean, Carcassonne uh, here, or uh, the uh, Augustus tomb in Rome. Note that uh, Khan's reception nutshell version of the plan of Philadelphia with its uh, cylinder-shaped uh, parking structures around and I don't want to, uh, to bore you with the details about this incredibly beautiful uh, light machine that the Mikre synagogue would have been if it would have been realized uh, in, in situ. Just to remind you of another of those beautiful models that are now uh, in this uh, Khan exhibition that I uh, have been uh, working on and that uh, are in the possession of the Museum of Modern Art. Now, while Khan is rather explicit about these archaeological affinities, Rome, Norman castles, etc., he is remarkably discreet as to possible inspirations that might have uh, that might be closer to home. In fact, of course, uh, if you wonder what might have been the key contemporary building for an architect to measure up against in 1955, an American architect to measure up in 1955, a key American building that somehow has to do with the circular spiral movement of circulation from bottom up, or actually from uh, top down, then of course there's only one building that must come to mind and that would come to mind, I'm sure you all have it before you, namely uh, the, uh, 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 actually I wanted to show the Guggenheim Museum by Frank Lloyd Wright, it was just barely finished at this moment, not to mention uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's proposals for Pittsburgh in, in uh, Pennsylvania of a few years previously, 1948. 47, which anticipate, uh, you know, very directly Kahn's version uh, for the parking structures in Philadelphia. Um, um, of course, uh, uh, needless to say that all this is not the entire story. There's much more to be said uh, regarding the, you know, open plaza, the forum idea that reverberates, of course, with some ideas that have to do with Sia, that have to do with the heart of the city, that have to do with the fascination of the Plaza San Marco, etc., etc. That is part of the story that finally you know, went into this uh, concept that was loathed by uh, Bacon, as we have seen um, in, in the beginning. Now, official Philadelphia decided that it was not concerned by these drawings. Bacon, as we have seen, considered these projects to be just awful. He made it clear in the film, and he made it clear previously in an unpublished note, posthumously addressed to Khan, where he's even more explicit. He says, I mean, Khan, why did you want to demolish the inner city of Philadelphia? You pretended to love Philadelphia, but you proposed actually an entire demolition, uh, an absolutely crazy uh, proposal. In fact, Bacon's frustrations with Khan must have been smoldering for years. And since Bacon wrote his one time famous book, Design of Cities, which I've mentioned already several times, in 1964, it's uh, this book, um, that is 1964, that is at a time when Khan's extravagant proposals for the market east area 
must have driven him almost crazy, and had driven him almost crazy, as we've seen in the beginning. Why then didn't he articulate his anger in this book, since this book was explicitly designed and edited to document the success story of Better Philadelphia and the ideas inspired, uh, that inspired it? In fact, and that's my final point, he actually did, but in a fashion that contrasts very sharply with the later outburst you have seen in the film. Bacon, in this book, acted undercover, as it were, as a diplomat, and by placing the message between the lines. While in two instances in this book, Kahn is explicitly referred to as an architectural authority in uh, the last the most telling reference, the most telling references are wrapped up in seemingly unrelated arguments, and most clearly so in the section on the Renaissance. In fact, the book has a rather lengthy, surprisingly long section on the Italian Renaissance, and it is here that Bacon discusses the aesthetic risks encountered, as he says, when a new technology that is not yet entirely under control begins to substitute old methods, unquote. A situation that can be compared to the situation of today, unquote, as he says. It is not difficult uh, to uh, you know, speculate what he may have had in mind. I think he must have had in mind uh, calm. But the example shown is not calm. The example is Francesco Di Giorgio Martini although referred to in the book as Nerocho di Bartolomeo, as was the standard attribution up to the 1980s for that particular uh, Predella painting. Due to a hasty appropriation of the recently discovered laws of perspective, so Bacon argues, the painter has organized the streetscape of this picture in terms of a correctly laid out pattern of squares, only to arbitrarily fill it with a hexagonal structure that creates a confusion of plan and results in superfluous spaces that are formless and coincidental, unquote. Worse even, in the Predella, that belongs to that uh, painting, in the Predella, the classic remains of Rome generated in the artist's mind, quote, the vision of a city with unharmonious forms standing all by themselves, unquote and, quote, being placed arbitrarily into an urban hole whose roof line stands off in a formless way against the sky. What a strange argument, you know, for a Philadelphia architect in 1965 to argue with Francesco Di Giorgio about, you know, the bad urbanism that he's proposed here. So I think Francesco Di Giorgio was a cover name for somebody else. And Bacon, in fact, continues, quote, this marvelous attempt of an artist to conceive the city as a unity in the light of the new ideas of the Renaissance demonstrates the incapacity of the times to intellectually grasp the problems of the city at that time. The close parallel to today's dominating architectural ideas, today's dominating architectural ideas, ha, 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 uh, should give us confidence for our own plans for the future as we follow the path that led from the morass, the morass, to the wide and powerful urbanistic concepts of the Baroque era. Now, what is this? Is this a naive projection of Beaux-Arts rules upon a jewel of 15th century Sienese art, or a vested diatribe against one of Philadelphia, uh, against the one Philadelphia architect likely to overshadow Bacon's own fame as a creator of better Philadelphia? In later years, Bacon's metaphysical disgust of what he believed Kahn stood for became all the more bizarre as Kahn's fame as an architect began to spread worldwide. I don't want to ponder what Bacon may have had in mind when he was contrasting that morass to the then following wide and powerful urbanistic concepts of the Baroque era, except for noting that uh, Bacon, in his book, is explicitly referring to Sixtus V and the planning of Baroque Rome as being his main inspiration, a story that must have 
that he must have learned, of course, from Gideon's space, time, and architecture. Nor do I want to follow up on the somewhat surprising, but after all, not that irrational, challenge to see Bacon's Philadelphia as a post-modern, a pre-post-modern site of wide and powerful urbanistic concepts of the Baroque. Now, returning to calm, it is hard, in retrospect, not to be struck by the degree to which Kahn's proposal reverberates with the idea of the city as a fair, if it does not de facto eerily anticipate current conceptualizations of the city as spectacle, spectacle diffus, as opposed to spectacle concentré, as the situationists used to say, at the very time Kahn worked on these proposals. Though, unlike Bacon, Kahn never spoke of the fair as a serious possibility for Philadelphia, let alone as a model, his architect's dream highlights the very same aspects of the city that Bacon, and even more so the national park system, were so eager to see celebrated and exploited in the years after World War II, except that it places the potential of architecture as sculpture at the center of the spectacle, not so much architecture as historical uh, document. Nor is it a coincidence that Kahn's description of the city center as essentially a labyrinth of pedestrian ways threading in the environment of great buildings and varied activities. This is literally Kahn's description of uh, his plan for Philadelphia. Reminds one of a travel guide description of Disneyland, after all, the project's almost exact contemporary, uh, so much, in fact, for veiled or illicit affinities as opposed to elected affinities, maybe another topic for the other conference. Seen in this context, the parking docks, objects of sculptural power, are an indispensable condition for the architecture of the core to unfold its own eminently sculptural drama, to live up finally to its second nature as an assembly of monuments, as a museum. Once visitors have passed through the colossal transformer that these uh, cylindrical towers uh, are, they re-emerge on the plaza as pedestrians, ready either to exercise their rights as citizens of the democracy, as you know, Kant would have liked it, or much more likely to leisurely stroll through the city and to experience its architecture as spectacle, as we ourselves do today when we stroll along New York's High Line and uh, have exactly, I think, I would argue, the kind of experience that Kahn was uh, anticipating in his proposals, to the point even that you find among Kahn's doodles of, you know, future, uh, of the future skyline of his ideal uh, Philadelphia, forms that, you know, strangely enough, uh, anticipate with certain forms that you see now emerge on the, uh, the small-scale skyline of Philadelphia. So thank you for your patience.